right. Welcome back to another episode of the Millennial Sales Podcast. This is your host, Tommy Tahoe Alemo. Uh, Super excited for this week's episode. We're into October, into the last quarter of the year, and um, got a great interview to share with you. Uh, Before we get into that, I want to give a quick two to five minute rundown, whatever this tends to be of what's going on in my world uh, before we get into, you know, the great people that I'm interviewing. Uh, So for this week, some people may have seen on my Instagram uh, or LinkedIn uh, over the past year, but I have been doing a monthly challenge every single month with uh, a few family members. Uh, We've recruited a few other folks uh, along the way. Uh, but every single month is a different thing. So we did sober January, we did cold showers in February, we did no social media in March, so on and so forth, uh, across a bunch of different disciplines of life. And um, October, we decided to do one thing that you're proud of every day. And I, I, I get that that might seem like a kind of a wishy-washy, a quick thing that you can check off every 10 seconds, but it's not really how my brain works. Uh, if you're anything like me, which you might be if you listen to this podcast, uh, you know, I spent an hour this morning, you know, going through my goals and planning out, you know, how did I do last week? What's what's on tap for this week? Pl- block off the calendar. Uh, where am I at for my goals for the year? And, and really focusing in on those big picture things. Uh, but it's not a standard practice for me to pat myself on the back and say, nice job, well done in you know this arena or anything like that. That's just not really how my mind works. So I'm excited for this month. Write down one thing every single day that I'm proud of. Take a moment, reflect, pat myself on the back, little woo-hoo, uh, and move on. So if anyone's with me, I'd, lo- I'd encourage you to try it out. Let me know what you think. I'm going to be posting uh, about it daily on my Instagram stories. So you can check me out, Tommy Tahoe on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, add me on LinkedIn, Tom Alemo. Uh, follow along. We got all the, the content here. Uh, the only thing I really do ask is if you found any value from this episode, anything that I'm putting out, uh, I don't do this for money. I don't do this for anything else, for vanity metrics. Uh, I do it because I love to learn and I love to help others learn. So uh, the one thing I'd ask is just subscribe. Uh, wherever you're listening, leave a review. If you're on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on Spotify, Apple, uh, YouTube. If you're watching, salute to you. Uh, this is my you know, little office room here. So um, without further ado, let's get into this week's conversation. So I had uh, Chris Rudy Grop. He is the founder and CEO of Sendoso, which is the leading sending platform. And um, what was really interesting, and the reason why I wanted Chris on the podcast is that I'm someone that's entrepreneurial. Uh, I've got a family business that my dad and aunt, uncle, grandfather have owned and operated for decades. And my mom's been working in you know different entrepreneurial ventures. And so I, I'm entrepreneurial and I, I want to run a business someday. And I get a little discouraged sometimes because I see CEOs of great companies, especially out here in San Francisco in the Bay Area, are product people. They're, they're people that are coding, they're engineers. Uh, that's not my forte. I'm not that's, you know, I'm not probably smart enough to do that. That's not something that has interested me necessarily. But I am interested in business and, and trying to run a business. And I think those are two completely different skill sets. But what you don't see enough of or what doesn't get acclaimed enough is the CEO that used to be a salesperson, the sales CEO, um, you know, my former, where I formerly worked tech target CEO was a salesperson. Um, there's a lot of other great companies and great entrepreneurs that were salespeople. Mark Cuban is, you know, salesperson. Uh, Bill McDermott, who runs ServiceNow, is a salesperson. Mark Benioff, um, you know, in a lot of ways, Phil Knight, when he talks about shoe dog is, is really a great salesperson. And, and really the CEO of a company they're always selling. They're selling the company. They're selling the product. They're selling when they're trying to recruit, when they're trying to get more investor money, whatever it is, they're always trying to sell something. And so I wanted to talk to someone that was a salesperson and moved into a CEO role. So uh, Chris is great. You know, he, a little background on his story. He was an account executive at a few places. He went to talk desk, which is a, an amazing startup out here in the Bay area. And while he was there, he had an idea. He was a very creative sales rep. He was you know, investing in tools outside of what they were giving him to try to sell the folks. He was 
you know, sending gift cards and things like that. And he wanted to create a platform where you could send gifts to customers and prospects um, in an in all-in-one platform, make it super easy, do the handwritten note, all that stuff with it. And um, what started as an idea about five years ago has turned into one of the hottest startups in San Francisco. They've raised $54 million. They're expanding rapidly. They're all over the place. And we had a great conversation. And we talk about Chris's background as a salesperson. We get into the evolution of being a salesperson and go, becoming the CEO of a company and what that entails, the leadership, uh, you know, trying to recruit people, uh, getting investor money and doing those pitches, leading people that are, you know, his age are a lot older than him or more experienced, yet he is the top leader at the company. And then even at, about the platform itself at Sendoso and, and why sending things can really be a lucrative thing for salespeople. So we get into all that. We have the selfish section where I ask him for a personal demo or a personal uh, trial rather of the tool. So that's fun. And uh, we get into everything, get into mentorship. So uh, Chris is great. You're going to love the episode. Um, check him out. You can add him on LinkedIn, Chris Rudy Grop. Uh, that is K-R-I-S space R-U-D-E-E-G-R double a p uh just you'll find him sendoso ceo uh add me wherever again you know leave some positive affirmations on apple or spotify or youtube send us some good vibes without further ado you're sick of hearing me talk let's get into this week's episode with chris rudy Grop. let's go All right. Welcome to Millennial Sales. Good morning, Chris. Rudy Grapp. How you doing, man? I'm doing really good, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm happy to have you on. Um, and I want to just get straight into it. So I think a lot of the listeners are probably somewhat familiar with uh, Sendo. So if not, they're about to be. Um, but I, you know what, what maybe some people don't know is that you started off as an AE before and transitioned straight from AE at TalkDesk. Uh, to start this company a, a few years ago. So I'd love to first start with, you know, what you were like as an AE, like, were you a top performer? Did you, were you always kind of prone to thinking outside the box with prospecting and working with customers and things like that? What, what was it? What was your experience as an AE like? Yeah. So um, I would say that I was definitely a crafty uh, AE in the sense of um, being a top performer, but also looking at different ways to be better. Um, my, uh, past couple CEOs always thought it was funny that I had a little mini team in India that would do lead gen and lead enrichment for me at night. Uh, this was, uh, you know, and I was uh, in AE from, you know, probably about 2013 to about 2000 or 2012 to about 2000, you know, uh, 17 when I started the company. And so that was kind of before the um, that there was just such an infinite uh, access to like leads and you know you actually had to like go and look on LinkedIn and have to get crafty with guessing emails or um, even before like the outreach and, and sales offs of the world uh, existed too. So I was I remember getting crafty and having to like figure out how to do these mail merges and track them and like manually make it look like I was following up from a previous mail merge because they just didn't have that software out there. So um, yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the, the, what team did you have in India? They were working for you overnight. Like you found them on Fiverr or something or what was, yeah. What was at the time I found them on, uh, Odesk, which eventually merged with Elance to create, uh, Upwork. But yeah, just okay. found uh, someone there and then, you know, it was like three bucks an hour and they, I, I would uh, export a report in Salesforce of like, uh, accounts that didn't have contacts or only had one contact and then they'd go and find me all the new ones and then I'd wake up in the morning and do my, my emailing and uh, do my calls and my you know uh, sending out gifts and stuff so it was a nice little process that shaved off some of my day-to-day -day time of doing like uh, kind of data entry or, or lead enrichment. So it's not you know that's not a lot of money obviously you know three bucks an hour mm -hmm. overnight for folks to do that but I think it, it speaks to you know, an idea of investing, you know, a little bit of, you know, effort and uh, money into helping your sales career be more successful. And you, know, you see a lot of reps or, or leaders that I've talked to, you know, do that in different ways, whether it's reading, whether it's investing in a virtual course, whether, 
their company doesn't support certain sales tools and they go out and buy it themselves. Like I, I bought sales navigator in the past when we didn't have it. Um, so I think that just speaks to, you know, kind of the commitment there. Was that an idea you got from somewhere? Or you were just like, Hey, I got to, I got to be entrepreneurial about this. I'm trying to make more sales to make more money. Exactly. I think that, you know, the best salespeople are almost mini CEOs of themselves. You, you're kind of owning your own destiny. You've got to hit your own quota. And what can you do to make it easy for you to hit quota? And so for me, it was like, I was looking at parts of, of my day to day that I could, you know, automate or delegate um, so that I could do other more high value tasks. So, um, and so that was really, um, it also allowed me to almost work 24 seven because I do the the day shift of my normal day doing demos and stuff. And then I'd have this person at night basically working for me. Um, so compared to the AE that's maybe sitting next to me working eight, nine hours, I'm working, you know, 18 hours a day yeah. in essence. So yeah, really got I, love that. Head. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And so let's walk through, you know, while you were at talk desk, I think you came up with the original idea yep. um, that, that eventually turned into Sendosa, but can you talk about, uh, that experience, what the problem was that you saw and, and how you were looking to address it at the time? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I saw happening. Um, you know, one was just, you know, I, I saw that email was becoming uh, kind of overly noisy and I was wanting to break through that noise by getting on people's desks or using like gifting and, and direct mail as a channel uh, outside of just the, the email, phone call, social channels. And I was like, hey, this fourth channel is underutilized. Let me use it. Again, it can be a, an easy way for me to get in front of people um, and also build that rapport. Um, as an AE, I was also not just, uh, I was doing prospecting and outbounding, but also as you know, you know, maintaining relationships for referrals and thereafter, after you close the deal. And so, you know, I was testing out, you know, going to Starbucks, buying Starbucks cards, sending those out. Um, I would like sneak into our swag closet and grab stuff. Um, and then Occasionally, marketing would try to collaborate with the sales team and say, hey, fill out this spreadsheet with who you want us to mail stuff to. And that was always a broken process, too, because it would take them like a month to get things out. And I'm like, a month in sales land is like a yeah. year. It's like yeah. that prospect was like already closed. And now you're going to send them a note saying, hey, you should jump on a trial. So I was always like, this can't be that slow. It has to be faster and it has to be more real time. And then it has to be enabled with tech too, as it was always this process of going to a spreadsheet, copying, pasting data from Salesforce into the spreadsheet. And then um, it just didn't feel right. And so I, I saw that there was an opportunity and I actually took the first jump kind of while working at TalkDesk uh, to build this coffee sender app. So that was actually the, I guess you could call it the version one of Sendoso. Um, where it was really just a Salesforce app that you could send Starbucks gift cards. And it was just a button inside the Salesforce that said send coffee. Um, so that was kind of a fun, I guess, baby step that helped me uh, drive my confidence up and just give me some more uh, motivation to take the bigger leap to build out Sendoso. Yeah, and then so how did you, at what point did you see enough traction on Coffee Sender that you thought that this was a, a legit enough idea to turn into a, a real business and quit your job? Yeah. So I would say I def, def, definitely Coffee Center had, a, you know, was doing a couple hundred thousand in revenue. Um, so that was like a, an interesting moment though. When I thought about it, uh, when I did the math, I was like, I'm going to have to, if I want to become a huge company, I'm going to have to sell like a billion Starbucks cards or something, which is <laughs> insane. So I knew it wasn't going to be the end all be all. And like, you know, you can't send just a million coffee cards every day and be successful. So it was kind of like a good uh, kind of MVP knowing that like sales and marketers want to do more than just kind of email and, and phone and social. And it was a good kind of test and MVP that like people will actually click a button in Salesforce and send something or in their other tools that they're using. So it kind of tested out some of my theories and hypotheses around like the integration, the use case, the, the kind of user behavior. Um, and then it was really just the pain point of seeing, you know, direct mail and gifting being such a spreadsheet driven process that I thought if I married the two, that's really where it would be a, you know, one plus one equals 10 kind of thing. And what was that 
transition like? Like, did you did you talk to the leadership at at your company? Were they supportive? Were they like, this is kind of a crazy idea? Like, what what was that like? Yeah. So, um, you know, I definitely uh, talked to the leadership. The CEO is uh, still one of my advisors and close friends. So, um, this was something that's like, hey, I'm I'm you know kind of ready to take off and and do my own thing and figure out what's next for me. And they're pretty supportive of it. Um, you know, I think as a good CEO, you know that certain employees are uh, good at certain times of the company, in essence. Um, so what I mean by that is I was a very good hacky kind of zero to one uh, account executive where, you know, I, um, and talk to us was scaling crazy fast. So, you know, there was, you know, uh, a huge team by the time I left. I think I was there when there was maybe 20 people and I left when there was like, you know, three, 400 people. So wow. it scaled pretty quick in the course of like a year or two. And now they're, you know, a multi-billion dollar company and just crushing it. Yeah. Um, but with that, you know, I saw that there was a time for me to take off and do my own thing. And, um, you know, the CEO and, and the CEO at the time too were pretty supportive and um, CEO very supportive in helping me in terms of uh, helping take the next steps and make some introductions too. So. That's great. And so you, you know, you kind of go off on your own. The good news is that you've got, it sounds like, you know, a couple hundred thousand in revenue that's coming in. So it's not like you're going from whatever your salary was to zero. You've got a little bit of a buffer there, but did you ever have in those early, like first 30, 60, 90 days, like, oh shit, like, I, I don't know if I, sh I should have done this. I'm went way over my head. Did you have that moment or was it really because you've been working on it so long, you had the conviction and, and kept moving it forward? Yeah, so I will say of the couple hundred thousand, our margins were super slim. So that mm. wasn't profit margins, that, that was just gross, or that was just revenue. So we were yeah. you know, doing probably, I think it was 10 or 20% margins on that. So it wasn't super sexy in terms of how much money was in the bank. So I definitely, once, we, once I quit and my co-founder and I had jumped in, we're, you know, eating top ramen and like, you know, not living the dream for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I remember where we were sending each other Starbucks gift cards and just trying to survive off of like Starbucks, like uh, food <laughs> for a minute. Yeah. yeah. We thought it was like an easier way to control costs as we'd be like, instead of giving each other salaries, it's like, okay, you get $1,000 in gift cards this month to survive. Go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. so there was a, um, you know, the, the revenue and the use case was just proof that people were willing to pay, but it definitely wasn't like proof that this was a, a valid scalable business. Um, so we kind of went back to the drawing board, um, and really drew up our vision for Sindoso and then spent about, uh, nine months basically winding coffee center down and getting ready to launch Sindoso. And so that was back to like zero revenue. Um, and so then we started back from scratch, um, with a kind of a different value proposition, uh, a, a different software and, um, then went to, to sell it. Um, luckily myself and my co-founder were both, my co-founder Braden were both salespeople at heart, um, and, and account executives in the past. Mm -hmm. So we knew how to sell. And so yeah. that was like, uh, you know, I think some, some companies are started by technical co-founders and so their go-to-market strategies are sometimes maybe slower to, to or, or maybe they're feature creeping and wanting to get things right or talking to customers isn't their forte. For us, we were selling before we were even uh, ready to have a product launch and we had customers, I think we even had some contracts signed from viewing a slide deck and not even a, de a real demo yet. So wow. we were that confident in it. Um, it was it was interesting for me because I shifted from being an account executive to re really being a, a product manager, engineering manager, um, kind of designer overnight, which was a nuance. Um, but luckily, I was solving a pain point that I knew, so I was really building for myself. So it was kind of like I was the customer, um, yeah. And so that made it a little bit easier. Did you use um, when you were initially trying to sell the platform? Did you use the platform itself to? help book business and help book meetings or is it too early in the stage where you were just doing cold emails and, and voicemails and stuff like that? Um, Pre-launch, uh, we just used emails, but once we went to market, we started to use our own product day in and day night. So, um, and I'd say, you know, we're, uh, I, I won't, I won't lie and say we, we use email for sure. Email is an obvious channel. And I, and I firmly believe that 
you know, using the right channel at the right time is key. So, you know, having a good mix of, of email and direct mail and gifting and social and, and phone calls and video is all super important in getting in front of your prospects, your customers and at the right medium at the right time. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, we, we definitely used our, our platform and even today are probably one of the biggest users, um, but still use all channels heavily. But that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, I feel, I feel like a lot of companies have a distinct advantage when they can say, you know, we eat our own dog food, so to yes. speak. Like we use the product every single day and that's why we're successful, whether it's a sales tool or, you know, an IT team or whatever the product is, but being able to, to say as a, as a sales rep, Hey, I use this every single day. And that's how I'm hitting my number is a pretty strong conviction uh, when you're trying to sell the product, I'm sure. Oh, it's fun too. Cause you're doing a demo and, or you're saying like, Hey, I just sent this to you and you're now you're on a meeting with me. Like, yeah. uh, so the proof is in the pudding there for sure. So at this point, can we talk about the, the product? So I haven't used the product before. I'm familiar, I've been familiar with you folks for a while, but could you talk a little bit about, you know, it started off as just Starbucks gift cards. Where are you now? Like how many different products are there um, that, that folks can send? Like what does the platform look like? Yeah, so there's uh, ultimately infinite products that you could send. I mean, we have uh, thousands of preferred vendor relationships where we're constantly sourcing new products. And we are also... Uh, uh, lend ourselves really well to creativity. And, and if you come to us and say, Hey, I want to do a pinata full of little mini booze bottles. We're like, perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> we'll go find it and source it and we'll figure it out. So that, uh, that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure we did is we didn't want to just be like a storefront with like 20 items and be a kind of a catalog business. We wanted to really open it up for limitless possibilities. So for sure we have, you know, suggestive items and things that work well, or we have uh, things we've done before but we always challenge our customers and, and challenge my internal customer success and project management team to be like, what is the greatest next thing that you can do? And what is, you know, the, the creative fit for this company that's targeting this ICP and, and what would work best there. Um, and I think that's the beauty of direct mail and gifting is it opens up this creativity channel that maybe has been lost in certain other channels, um, specifically the personalization that creativity gives you um, and breaking through the noise, whether it's, a uh, branded item or whether it's a one-off item based on maybe something that you're interested in based on your interests. So we can really hone in on one-to-one -one gift or one to 10,000. It's, it's, uh, it's up to you and our customer on what they want. But, um, you know, I think the cool thing is, is there's just unlimited possibilities. Yeah. And, and, and talk a little bit about creativity and sales. And I agree a lot of that I think has gotten lost with um, a heavy focus on, you know, the art and science. There's a lot of focus, I feel like right now on the science mm -hmm. and sales engagement and, you know, trying to personalize at scale and send a thousand emails a week and this and that. Um, and we lose a little bit of the art side. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you on, you know, a company that uh, believes in the creativity in sales and you sell to sales leaders, mm -hmm. right? So you have to be on your game when you're selling because these people that you're selling to have been in the business for, for decades, right? Yep. And they, they can, you know, they can smell BS and they know exactly what, what all the tactics, the closing tactics. So how do you folks train your sales team to be world-class to be able to sell to other sales leaders as well? Yeah. I mean, we honestly do a lot of consultative sales. It's like, Hey, this is what we offer. Um, we're, we're in a great place where we're a lot of times not as much selling and just showing and saying, Hey, here's what we do. Here's the platform. Here's how we do it. Um, uh, and, uh, and then it's more of like, Hey, yeah, I want that. Um, so there's, a and, and then, like you said, eating our own dog food, you know, we're, uh, Sendosuing our prospects, um, day in and day out, you know, we're getting creative with it. Um, and I think, like you said, we're seeing a shift where, you know, the, the science of sales engagement, I think has been figured out and companies are, have, have really focused and honed in on that maybe the last year. And we saw an explosion of these sales engagement tools that are really necessary to create these kind of optimized workflows that you can do day in and day out. And now when you come back to the art side, it's like, how can we add in that personal layer, that creativity layer into the sales engagement tool? So we have, you know, awesome in, in integrations with like the, the sales loft outreach, Zants, Grooves of the world. So it's kind of the best of both worlds where you can have a outbound engine that, you know, is uh, repeatable, but then you can interject in very timely, like gifts or direct mail um, at scale too, so. 
And you and you kind of give free reign to, or you would recommend a customer gives uh, free reign as long as it's appropriate, obviously, for the SCR or the AE to to be creative. And it's not like, hey, just send you know company T-shirts to prospects on the third touch. It's like, no, try to use your your brain and get creative and try new different things and A/B test it. Uh, yeah, we just like that's best practice. Yeah, so we look at it in a couple different ways. In some cases, there's uh, an advantage to having a consistent send that's like you know, step four, always send this like printed ebook with a handwritten note that's uh, covering X, Y, Z. And so that's like a more of a prescribed play that's like, let's do that more often. Or like, you know, if they uh, agree to a meeting, then send a Starbucks card the morning of so that you drive up this. So there's certain plays that are more of like repeatable and successful. And then there's certain steps where you're like, okay, use this personal touch. And we have a really cool Amazon integration um, to where, you know, a, a pro, an AE or an SDR can, can go and do a little prospect research or, or leverage our intelligence and see that this person, you know, went to a certain college, likes a sports team, you know, tweeted about, you know, the sport or whatever. And then through our Amazon integration, you can go in and you can use your allocated balance. So marketing leaders or sales leaders can say, hey, SDRs, you get, you know, a thousand bucks a month to spend. And here's the, you know, eight different things that you can send. One of them being like a catch all for Amazon. And I go and research and see you went to this university and send you this, you know, little beanie because it's cold out now. And your uh, the Amazon integration allows you to use your Sendoso money. It sends to our warehouse where we unbox it, add a handwritten note, make it look super personal, and then ship it out to the recipient, all tracked through like, you know, the sales engagement tools or, or Salesforce, et cetera. And so you can really connect on a one-to-one -one level with a personalized gift. Um, but do so at a scale and, and track that success through, through Salesforce reports, et cetera. So yeah. um, that's really where the art and creativity comes in, but you're using it in your day-to-day -day workflow where it's always coming into step seven of your outreach so you could repeat it too. So I think we really, uh, to your point, really nailed the, the art of that, which the science has already been nailed. So. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I want to pivot a little bit to, um, you know, that, that, you know, back to the transition from, you know, AE to CEO. And, and I'm mm -hmm. curious as, as someone that's, you know, also an AE that is interested in entrepreneurship and things like that in the future, like what, what are some of the skills you talked about, obviously being a sales guy, you know, uh, and your co-founder being salespeople, like you can, it was somewhat easy for you to sell in the early onslaught. Maybe it was more difficult uh, to do some of the product or design because that wasn't really your forte. But how has that, how have some of those skills transferred as you've continued to grow the company uh, in terms of how you've led people, how you've helped to scale, uh, some of the maybe the pitfalls that you've fallen into, um, how have some of those skills either transferred or, or where did maybe you have to grow in certain areas? Yeah, so I think my sales acumen really helped in the early days and still up to now in terms of recruiting. So I mm -hmm. think Sales and recruiting have a lot of similarities. It's just a different product that you're, you're offering up. Um, and so recruiting is, I think, the lifeblood of, of Sendoso. I mean, we've scaled in the last couple of years from like zero to over 250 people. And wow. so that takes a lot of effort um, and a lot of day in and day out. And for me, wanting to be close to that process because I think people are the foundation of everything. And so um, I really had to uh, learn how to, to recruit at scale and also how, you know, spend a lot of time recruiting. So I think being uh, an extrovert, being able to talk to people, being able to kind of articulate a, a dream and a vision and kind of sell some dose so to other people, uh, the vision of working here um, had some similarities to when I was, you know, selling software at another company. So I think that re um, that really helped me in terms of, getting uh, others on board this rocket ship um, in the early days. Um, now it's a little easier because we've got some traction in a brand name and I don't have to do as much selling. And I also have a lot of other amazing executives and, and directors and managers that do recruiting. But uh, in the early days where there, people are like, what is this? What's this idea? Like, how many people do you have? Uh, it's, uh, it was helpful that I could uh, do a good job of selling them on the dream of Send No Sell. In, in a did you ever... Did you ever feel weird or, or do you ever feel weird um, that you're running, you know, a you know, high growth company and, you know, I don't know exactly how old you are, but probably somewhere in your early thirties um, and you're trying to recruit, you know, great talent and trying to lead different people. And this is your first go at, at leadership and at running a company. Do you ever, 
do you ever feel like any sort of imposter syndrome with that or at least in the early days or or um, maybe it's because you believe so strongly in, in what you've built in the product and the company that that kind of carries you forward yeah so i think it's the latter which is just like i have so much confidence in our product and our team and, and what we're building the category we've created and the the industry we're leading that you know i think i'm better than anyone to do this is it's like I felt this pain I I know what our customers wanted and um, with that though I've surrounded myself with amazing leadership too so there's you know uh, hundreds of amazing people at my company dozens of you know uh, leaders that are smarter than me and so I think that's been helpful too and uh, hiring people across the entire company that can really pick up where, where maybe I'm weak um, and I can collaborate and be a good leader, um, but let them double down on their focus areas too. So I think it goes back to, you know, building a, a great people company. Um, and uh, I think, sure, my age, um, you know, you know, is, you know, maybe young for uh, a CEO at times, but at the same time, it, it also, I think, gives hope to people on the team. It also gives me a different perspective. Um, you know, and um, in turn, I think it, it's done really well for me in terms of helping us grow. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think the, the, the conviction of which you said like, hey, there's no one better than me to be able to run this company because I've experienced the pain points and I've felt this pain firsthand. Like, you know, I, I believe you when you say that. And I, I'm curious, like, the, where does that confidence come from? Because there's a lot of people, whether they're running a company or they're just trying to run their own lives, don't feel that way you know they, they they have more maybe more self-doubt or negativity creep in so i'm curious if, if that's something you've, you've always just been super confident like that if it's been something you had to work on or you know a lesson you learned or anything like that but i think confidence is is something that you know you can feel through the phone on the conversation right now yeah i mean i think again it goes back to being in sales you know if you're a good salesperson you got to be confident about what you're selling and so for the last decade being in sales having building my confidence that way and being my conviction over phone calls um, and, and doing demos and, and being an in, in inside sales rep helped me get to where I was today. Um, in addition to that, I think there's uh, just a level of, of confidence now more than ever just because of what I've been able to accomplish. So it, it's hard not to uh, be the, uh, you know, sm smile and, and be strong in my conviction that way. Um, but I mean, even growing up, I'd say I, I was an optimist and I've always kind of uh, been more on the, uh, you know, uh, happy and confident and kind of optimistic side um, my whole life. And so I think that's just kind of a personality trait too that's uh, acted in my favor. Yeah. And and speaking of, of this topic, so, you know, you folks have raised almost $53 million uh, in venture funding. I think you have nine different investors um, throughout the, the last few years of the company growth. What's that? How's that different in terms of the pitch, in terms of, uh, you know, the legwork, the mentality of trying to get people to invest in you and your business and your idea versus uh, trying to sell a product, whether it's a product that you're an AE for or the product that you, you help to create with your co-founder? How's that different? And, and is it intimidating at all going into those boardrooms or maybe it's Zoom calls? uh with folks uh, as you're really trying to pitch yourself and your idea to help them back you yeah so i mean going back to being an ae you know i really learned how to pitch people well and control a room you know and get on a call and really present a presentation with uh you know strong conviction and, and really sell the dream and so that really you know the thing changed from selling a software product to selling the the company vision and our in the company to an investor but again, I think some of the stuff I learned from doing hundreds or thousands of, of demos or in-person meetings and closing deals uh, as an AE paid off in, in spades for being a, a CEO trying to, the new product is Sendoso is the company and I'm, I'm trying to sell to a VC to get their money. So I think, you know, the check size is obviously way different and uh, yeah. the, the, the benefit <laughs> is way different, but some of my sales skills really lended itself well. Um, so I, I just approached it as just like, you know, another prospect and, you know, you're going to get no's, you're going to get yeses, you're going to uh, just have to show that you, you really believe in it and, and jump in. And, you know, with that though, I would say that in the very early days, we, we bootstrapped for a, a kind of a, an early part of our life, I guess, maybe like the first year. 
And so we had the benefit of when we were going into kind of our seed stage meetings, we had um, I think about a, a half a million in ARR, not a lot, but it was enough that there was enough traction and customers that we actually were like, this works and, you know, we're, we're trending. Um, mm -hmm. So we did, uh, you know, bootstrap, put a little bit of our own money in in the early days to get it to a point where we, we actually could say, could have customer stories and, and traction. And that made it a little easier from, from the seed round. And then obviously from seed to A to B, we've scaled up and, and had great numbers since. Um, and so that also helped. Um, but yeah, going back to being an AE, I mean, I think there's a lot of stories where you hear, you know, product and eng folks start companies and, a, and, and AEs, you don't see the AE to CEO uh, story as much, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, similarities in terms of things I had to do as an AE that have paid off really well. Um, you know, raising money, hiring great people, selling to early customers that, you know, if I wasn't an AE and had that skill set, it could have been a lot harder. Yeah. And I, I think it's, yeah, usually the story is, uh, it seems like at least in, in, you know, the Bay area is like, you know, it's an engineer or someone that's technical and then they have to learn how to be a business person. They have to learn how to sell, which is a, another interesting thing. And they, mm -hmm. they're probably usually very against that and think the product's going to sell itself. Um, just out of curiosity, how did you, how did you actually create the product? Did you, it, was it another move where you were working with someone from Upwork? Do you have a friend that you know that's in like the uh, development? How did that work? Yeah, so uh, originally it actually was Upwork. So wow. I found someone <laughs> off of Upwork um, back in the day and then uh, was able to just continue that relationship um, and expand on it from there. So now we've got something like uh, 70 engineers or something, 80 engineers and an R&D team. It's over 100 people now. But um, yeah, it all started with, you know, having a, an MVP built through Upwork because I found that that was the quickest means to getting to market. Um, and it was something that, you know, was easy uh, for me to conceptualize of, hey, I can create the mockups, draw up the vision, here's all the screens that I need. Um, I, I could say that my design skills were pretty uh, shitty or, um, <laughs> not, you know, not, not great day one. Um, now we have amazing designers, which is awesome. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't sweat the small stuff. It's like it worked well. It did what I wanted and, you know, and then was able to articulate that to some engineers. And then, you know, as we added more customers, raised more money, as we were able to scale that engineering team out. And now I've got a world-class engineering team, an amazing CTO and, and, and VP of engineering and all of that. So we've got an uh, amazing team now. But, you know, I think in some, some ways it's easier for some people to, to think about how can I find a technical co-founder and leverage their expertise. Um, and in certain industries or products, you know, maybe that's necessary, but for other products and industries, you know, there's an, an, an option to take the jump and do it yourself and kind of be a business co-founder uh, and go find a, an engineer that you can hire and go that route. And so, yeah you know, Upwork makes that easy. There's also other ways to do that locally. If you want to, you know, sit in a room together and find someone uh, locally, um, cost-wise, it might be a little bit more expensive, but, you know, I think there's advantages to both. Um, so, yeah. And, and what's your, you know, you mentioned the great team a number of times, um, you know, across the board, top to bottom. So what do you have a philosophy in terms of how you hire, what you look for, uh, any red flags of, of what doesn't fit with the culture, what you're trying to hire for and, and build? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that, you know, outside of your typical interview process, you know, there were, I, I like to look for up and comers sometimes more than someone that has a, you know, five page resume. Um, so I think like kind of the hustle mentality, people with the ambition that want to prove themselves. Um, so I, I tend to look for those types of individuals. Obviously, people that have a ton of experience are also awesome, and you've got to kind of offset each other um, in that regards. Um, I'm a big fan of like people's personality and building a culture. So I think that outside of just a resume, how do you mesh well with the company? You know, um, would I want to you know go on get on a plane and hang out with you for a week? You know, things like yeah. that, that nature. So really trying to build a, a place that are a friendly environment that people love to work in. Um, and so that's also just as important as someone that has top talent um, that, you know, can execute well in, in their skill set. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm still very close with the hiring process. I love 
working with um, our recruiting team and our uh, different department heads um, and you know across the board I'm uh, still very involved in making sure that we're onboarding you know awesome new people every day yeah and you know we're talking about hiring we're talking about going out and getting you know tens of millions of dollars in venture capital we're talking about scaling companies we're talking about all these different things that you had no experience doing you know five or so years ago um, how much of this has been learned on the fly and how much has been like you seeking out maybe mentors uh, in the space and like asking them for help uh, or maybe it's a combination but but how, what's your to, like what's the best way for you to learn these things is it is it through is it through your own learning or, or other folks yeah, so I'd probably bucket it into like uh, three categories. I'd say probably uh, first category is just learn by doing and mm -hmm. kind of either fail fast or just like figure it out. I'd probably say that counts for, you know, 33%. I'd say the other 33% is surrounding myself with executives or other smart people at the company um, or, or even uh, not even executive, even like individual contributors that just like are awesome in what they do. And so I'd say that's another third in terms of just like how we're doing what we're doing. And then I'd say the other third is just really advisors and investors. So um, early on, you know, really built a, a world-class advisory group and continue to add to that. And that has really helped with kind of mentorship, with advice, with hiring and recruiting, with introductions. Um, and so I would say that that's something that um, you know, I, I started day zero to look for advisors and that's really, uh, something that's helped us grow and, um, you know, hit some early milestones because it was, you know, getting an intro to an investor or finding a, a, a key hire, um, coming from an advisor, um, made all the difference and something that I always recommend to other entrepreneurs getting going is like building an advisory group day zero. You know, some people might be, uh, uh, equity greedy. Um, but I'd say, hey, it's worth kind of offering up some shares and, you know, expanding your circle that way. Did you ever do anything around like uh, an informal advisory group or, or work on mentors when you were an AE as well? And have those folks continued to help you? Or was that more, more maybe people at your company? And then once you tried to expand and, and turn into an entrepreneur, uh, you sought out more people. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I wish I did. And when I look back, you know, as an AE, I think that, you know, why didn't I um, look at more advisors? And I think for me at the time, it was maybe more of like a little bit of self-doubt in terms of like, what am I getting advice from? Um, as like, is it interesting to advise an AE at a, a startup? And I think that was the wrong mentality. Um, now my AEs and a lot of people in my company, I uh, introduce them to our advisory group. So we've got from our advisors, um, there's maybe CROs, VPs of sales, other folks that they can uh, tap into from a mentorship. And so it's more of a proactive way for me to say, hey, hey, any one of our employees can access our, um, you know, dozens and dozens of advisors. And I think that from an executive level telling my employees like, hey, I strongly recommend advisors and mentors has really helped our, uh, my employees and my team see that that's something that's a, a cool idea to do. Um, and so that, that's something that I kind of learned and wish that I um, had when I was an AE. And so some of our, you know, our, some of our early AEs that are now sales leaders now have, you know, advisors that, you know, talk to them on the weekly basis. And I think that's a key way to build relationships through advisors and, and, and ask them versus always asking your internal uh, stakeholders as well so yeah I, I love that's a great leadership move I hadn't heard of anyone doing that before mm -hmm. of, of you know offering up here are the people that are helping me and helping our company yeah. anyone can have access to them you just got to have a little you know kind of gusto and, and go out and reach out on your own but they'll help you and uh, I'm sure they already agreed because if they're advising you and the company they're happy to advise an individual contributor to see success there exactly I think that's cool. I think that's really cool. Um, so, you know, one, one question about the product. Uh, so let's say, you know, I'm an AE or, or an SDR. My company just bought Sendoso. Um, I'm sure you've got a great customer success team that helps with some of the plays and what works and what doesn't. But what's a common mistake that you folks see people do or, or what's a struggle? What's something that people do with either your product or maybe it's just, you know, personalized gifts in, in general that is kind of like a, you know, a common mistake that sales reps are making? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing is, um, you know, maybe not building it into your process and just kind of knowing that it exists, but forgetting about it and forgetting about it. Um, mm -hmm. Or um, I think when you can build things into your process, your workflows or like, you know, hey, this is step four and step nine and step 12 or, uh, you know, I'm going to send after these scenarios helps kind of build that mental habit. I think it's like anything in life, there's a bit of change management and then there's a bit of like, you know, getting in the habit of doing something. And so with anything new, it, you know, Sinoso seems obvious, like, oh, I'm gonna send a gift to this prospect. But if you do it once and then don't do it again for a while, you know, it's kind of like you wanna get in the habit of doing things. So we try to teach people like, hey, here's how we can train our customers or train our customers to train their reps on how to be the most successful and become uh, using this in a habit and, and, and learning the best practices on how you can be the best salesperson by using us. I think that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is just continuing to push the envelope on new ideas that you can, new things that you can send um, and how you're personalizing it and how you're uh, not thinking about it as like a um, kind of a, a golden arrow that you could just like send out something and everyone's going to respond, but you still have to do all the other outreach tactics. So say, you know, sending an email and then, a, you know, a gift and then a phone call follow up. So there's still this, you know, multi uh, omni channel outreach process. Um, you know, it's not like you can just like close your eyes, blast out a hundred things in the mail, um, our gifts, and then just like, you know, sit back and wait for calendars to fill up. Um, I think you still have to be very, uh, um, you know, strategic in how you're using it as just another tool in your tool belt and how you're crafting your, you know, uh, outreach strategy of this is just one other step that I'm using to like break through the noise or to build a relationship with these prospects and customers. And do, and do folks ever use the, like a tactic of, Hey, I'll, if you take a meeting, I'll, this is what I'm going to send you. Or is it more so here's pro proactive. I'm sending you this, you know, something witty maybe. And then it's like, I hope, you know, we can help to share how our product can help with your problems or whatever. I think it's all of the above. You know, that's yeah. the, the beauty of our platform is you can kind of tailor it to different situations and you can A-B test, which I think, you know, the best salespeople are these kind of scientists who are like, you know, I can test out this. Is this working better than this? Um, so in certain scenarios, you know, we see people using it as kind of a pay it forward method, kind of giving the gift up front and then thereafter seeing that there's a reciprocal response of like you know taking a meeting or in some cases maybe it's like a a, a gift that's a, kind of a two-part gift it's like hey here's the the drone controller take the meeting I'll give you the drone or in some cases it's like hey would love your your meeting schedule time on my calendar and then you know the gift will be sent your way so I don't I, there's not like a secret formula I don't think and you know with the world that we live in where different people are responding to different things or different personas um are you know responsive to different types of gifts at different times of their cus of the kind of prospecting life cycle um you know that's really where i'd say that we're not just like a one size fits all in terms of like you can do this thing to everyone it's like we're a platform that you we give you the tools to that you can then kind of send anything to anyone and integrate it into your process but you know you have to be uh you know prescriptive in terms of how you think about that at times and one thing I thought was cool that I've heard you talk about too is that uh, you can you can send some sort of a you know either a charity request or yep. send them something on on behalf of whatever charity they want. Um, so for whether you want to do that out of the goodness of your heart or if it's an industry that is regulated and you can't send gifts or maybe it's the holidays that are coming up. Um, so I just thought that was a cool way to mix up from the traditional Starbucks gift card, bottle of wine, you know old alumni college t-shirt whatever it might be so i thought that was a cool thing too yeah 100 percent. it's awesome to see we've seen hundreds of thousands of dollars in charity donations to date um probably approaching millions uh, i haven't checked in a while um so that feels good from just a company perspective and then you know the recipient also um in some cases it's just a, a charity offering or in some cases it's a, a gift or a donation to charity so if the recipient is like you know what i'd rather just donate to charity then that value can just be donated. And uh, typically we have uh, these charity choice type offerings where, you know, the recipient can say, hey, I'm really passionate about, you know, the World Wildlife Fund or about the SPCA or about, you know, this, the 
you know, uh, firefighters and, you know, this, you know, Red Cross. So it's usually a really personalized charity. So the recipient can donate to where they want as well, which um, feels good on the recipient side too. So yeah, that's great. I love that. I love that. So um, as we're wrapping up, I want to take you to uh, what I call the selfish section of the podcast. Okay. So each episode I ask one selfish question that's just for me. It's not for the listeners. You don't even have to listen uh, if you're in the, in the audience. Um, so I just started as an AE at a new role actually uh, a week ago today. Um, and we don't have Sendoso. Uh, I've personally used gifts, handwritten notes, Starbucks gift cards, things like that in the past. How do I either build a business case for my company or how do I just get one license so that I can go crazy with this thing and, and start, you know, selling some deals? Yeah. So you, to your first question in terms of building a business case, we've got an awesome resource library with a, a ton of case studies and use case examples on our website. So there's a, a, a great way for you to say, like, look at all these uh, awesome use cases and, and metrics and things that we can do. And by the way, it integrates into our tech stack and our tools we're already using. And by the way, it has budget controls and this and that and this and that. So we've armed, um, you know, our buyers with a lot of information on our website or go over to G2 and look at, um, you know, our, I think 400 reviews so that you can tell your boss like, Hey, like this works and look at all these stories to tell. Um, so I'd say that's one way for your individual license, um, to give you a little secret sneak peek, we're actually rolling out, uh, a, an individual plan for individual sellers like yourself. That's, um, in beta and rolling out in, in general availability soon. So, uh, catch me uh, offline. I, I know you, I have your contact information and I'll get you into that beta list and you can uh, get the individual plan. So that's what I'm talking about right there. That's why the selfish section the, exists. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you asked. And you know, our, my goal of that was really to um, help people like yourself or like me in, in the space of that, you know, these uh, awesome AEs that want to, you know, break out from the pack. And so you can come in as an AE, get an individual license, see some success, test out what's working. Um, and then, you know, prove firsthand that, you, that it's working well. And then, hey, boss, let's get this for the whole team. And then you look like a rock star and you're, you're crushing quota. And then the whole team can have access thereafter. So um, love it. Yeah. And when does that, do you have a date for when that becomes general? Uh, um, availability? Uh, we're going to be rolling that out at the end of this year uh, for general availability, um, uh, if not sooner. Um, but um, yeah, for beta, um, I can get you on that uh, right away. And Let's get it going. I'll report back to the listeners with all the meetings that I book. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Chris, I appreciate you've been super generous this morning with your time, uh, with your stories. Uh, where can folks find you, connect with you, and, and obviously learn more about Sendoso and, and what you folks are building? Yeah, so um, if you want to learn more about Sendoso, it's sendoso.com, S-E-N-D-O-S-O.com. Um, I'm always happy to connect on LinkedIn, so find me on LinkedIn, shoot me a connection request. Um, or email me. It's Chris, it's K-R-I-S at Sendoso.com. So happy to chat. You know, I always love shooting the shit, kind of a virtual coffee, so to speak, these days. Um, and I always love networking. So uh, shoot me a note on LinkedIn or email and would, would love to connect with more people. All right. That's awesome. You heard him, people. Hit him up, flood his inbox. Uh, let him know you heard him on this episode. And uh, Chris, I appreciate the time. Um, and, uh, and best of luck to you. Thanks for taking some time this morning. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it.